This is a portrait of Basho. Basho died 300 years ago this year. Now he is Japan's greatest poet. We are taking one of Basho's writings. It's a travel diary of a journey that he took near the end of his life from the city that is now called Tokyo, and then was called Edo. Edo is the largest city, and has been the largest city, on the largest of the Japanese islands. There are four main islands, and the largest one is named Honshu. And Edo is about, well, halfway between north and south of the main island of Honshu. The deep north is usually the top of the island of Honshu. And so Basho's journey would be north of Tokyo into the heavy forested mountain regions of northern Honshu. We would think today the deep north of Japan would be Hokkaido Island. But 300 years ago, the Japanese shogunate did not have very strict control over that island and those areas. And so the deep north to Basho was northern Honshu. And the first place that he would go to would be the city of Nikko, Nikko, Japan. And Nikko, Japan is characterized by trees that are like the ones in this Japanese print. Very large cryptomeria trees, very much like our sequoia, like our giant sequoia trees. And so Basho would be a traveler going out of the crowded city of Edo, near the end of his life, wandering into the deep north through these enormous forests. The reason that we're taking Basho is that we're discussing ritual, and we would like to be able to be clear in our experience why it is that ritual is the mode by which existence becomes objective. The old philosophical phrase popularized by René Descartes, who was a contemporary of Basho, but lived in France, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, is flawed on many levels and mistaken thoroughly. Because we do not exist because we think. Many levels of activity occur before thought occurs. And the very first level is that existence itself occurs. I do not exist because I think, but I exist because I exist, which is not tautological at all. It has a peculiar quality, existence. Its quality is that it is objective. It actually occurs, is what we would call real. This cup is objectively real. I can pick it up and manipulate it, I can use it. I too find I have a body that is objectively real. Objects occur on an existential level, on a plane as it were. And this plane is a surface. The question that we have looked at for several months is what is beneath the surface? of the plane of existence. It's as if existence is the surface covering on an ocean, which is nature. So that the surface of nature is the plane of existence. And like all surfaces, it has a certain viscosity. That is to say that its elements tend 
to stick together and make a web, make a fabric, make a texture, make a plane, which is objective and supports the real existence, the objective empirical reality, as we would say, of things, of ourself included. Nowhere in nature and nowhere in existence is there any evidence of thought. It is a projection from someone's mind to suppose that there is thought there. And in fact, the whole impetus of deep contemplation, of meditation, of prayer, of poetry, of creativity, the whole impetus of these higher activities is to quiet the mind, turn off the radio of our thoughts, stop the projecting of ourselves, stop putting the cookie cutter of our self on everything we do and see, and to slowly relax and enjoy nature as it is. To take a walk among huge trees is relaxing to us, and it would be observed to take a walk holding a radio with a rock station to your ear. You're not in nature. So you would take the radio away from your ear. It's the same thing if your mind keeps going over the problems that you have and you're walking among these large trees, you're not with the trees, you're not with nature, you're with your problems. And so, instead of I think, therefore I am, I am because I have learned to momentarily at least stop thinking. Now notice that one of the great shared qualities of human beings around the entire planet for all times is that the movement of walking is like a common denominator of finding the tone of existence. The kind of physiology that comes out of late 20th century science investigating human origins comes up again and again with the fact that bipedalism, walking on two legs, on two feet, was one of the crucial changes that a mammal that walks on all fours has a different quality of sense perception from a mammal that walks on two legs. The upright position, freeing the arms, freeing the hands, creates a different way in which the gestalt of perception is formed. When you are on all fours, the sense of smell is the leading primary quality. And when you are on two legs, the eyes become primordial. So that sight perception, seeing, leads the whole array of making gestalts. And when the hands are free, the movement for nourishment, for food, requires a change in sight. The change is that one must be color-coded. You cannot tell which fruit is ripe unless you can see the colors. You cannot tell which leaves are going to be young and tasty without being able to see variations of green. So that bipedalism is like a change for the whole gestalt of the way in which perception happens. Which means then that existence occurs in a different variant for two-legged upright creatures than it does for four-legged uh, loping or crawling creatures. When smell is the leading sense, there is a continuity of sense perception that is always happening. 
when sight happens to be the leading edge of perception, then there are frames of reference. There are gestalts, there are episodes to sense perception. And the main quality then that is needed is to somehow knit together these frames of reference and make them a film, a movie of what's going on. And so when eyesight takes over the gestalt, we need to develop a sense of how to put together the images. And putting get together the images is exactly the quality that lifts ritual existence out of its plane into the upper atmosphere of expressive language. And it's as if language is the air above the plane of existence and nature is the ocean beneath the plane of existence. So that there is a primordial quality to, to the image of standing on a shoreline of an ocean and looking out to sea. And you see the body of water and you see the sky. Or even more indelibly, to be on a boat that goes out of sight of land so that the only experience that you have is that of the ocean and the sky. And those who are reading, for instance, Moby Dick as the year-long text integrating this first year of the course, recognize in Melville's images always that water always keys in a profound sense of sinking into the depths of imagination, a kind of an eminence. Whereas when we look to the sky, we sink into the depths of a different quality of imagination. The water has a kind of an imminence to it. The sky has a kind of a transcendence to it. And that in between the sky and the ocean, in between language and its atmospheres of experience, in between language and its sphere of experience and nature and its ocean is this plane that is the interface between the two where existence happens. And so existence is sandwiched in between two very large realms that have no definite shapes. They are just enormous. And so the sky of language and the ocean of nature have no particular forms in and of themselves, but take instead, like water or air would, the shapes given to them by existence. But the shapes are made on the plane of existence and not in the sky of experience and not in the ocean of nature. So that the ritual level is this area where the shaping takes place. So that objective reality, our confidence that things are real and that what we do with them will stick, comes not from a hope or an expectation, but from a certitude and a confidence. It really happens, and we know that it happens, and we can trust that. So that part of the restoration that is necessary to go on with life, to be adventurous with new episodes of life, new realms of life, to be able to do something new, rests upon our ability to participate 
with existence on the ritual level. And yet there's a paradox here. Because the very quality of confidence that comes from trusting the ritual level also tends to keep us frozen there on the ritual level and not let us go. Not that we are imprisoned by existence, but that we become addicted to needing the certitude of the ritual level to guarantee our confidence. And so we cling to the traditional rituals because they're the only arbiter of reality in between the ocean of nature and the sky of experience. And we are convinced that if we leave that plane of existence, we have to be darn sure, well, let's put it in the Hollywood style, we have to be goddamn sure that we can get back. We have to have the confidence that we can get back to an objective level of our actions. And if we stay away too long, we get very upset, very squeamish, in fact, sometimes neurotic. But look here. Existence, the plane of ritual, is not in and of itself anything other than the viscosity of the surface of nature. And so when we tend to want to come back to the objective reality of ritual, the real satisfaction comes from immersing ourselves back into the mystery of nature and coming back out of the mystery of nature and then the confidence of the ritual level is certain. This is the whole motive for sleeping. All conscious entities sleep. All conscious entities sleep. Animals sleep. Human beings sleep. Gods sleep. All conscious beings sleep. Because it's the only way of renewing, of going back into nature. Sleep is an immersion back into nature. And ritual is that objective surface of the mysterious sleep realm of nature. Where what we bring out of the sleep, what we bring out of nature, images, become for us the shapes, the building blocks of the forms that we make in our existence. Now, in order to bring such a complex ecology of events into a simple focus, we made masks. We chose the mask as a ritual implement to be the archetypal example of the way in which existence first, primordially, happens. And in the simple yet complex way of making a mask, everything that we need to know about existence is summarized there. Everything we need to do, know about the ecology of how nature allows them for a ritual objectivity to continue to exist, to register as something objectively real. And how that object then gives a basis out of which language rises. Literally, the mask that you made of something from your diet, the mask of a food, the mask of, of something in your diet, a drink perhaps, the mask of milk, the mask of honey, whatever it is. Making a mask of something from your diet is the most primordial activity that one could do. 
to make an, a face for a food is like being able to introduce the idea of zero into mathematics. Before there was a poignant idea of zero in mathematics, there was no understanding of the powers of number. As we talked last week, there was the capacity to have an arithmetical counting, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But there was no capacity to have powers of number. One, ten, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million, ten million, a hundred million, a billion. By the time one counts to nine, you're at a billion. So that the powers of number are there because of the idea of zero. And the same thing happens with the mass. The introduction of the mass into the lifestyle of a creature allows for powers of images to occur to them. And when images occur in powers, one gets the confidence that not only is the plane of existence a single plane, but it is multiple planes that has levels, and one would like to know how many levels are there. And the traditional solution on this planet, for all time, all cultures, is that there are either seven or nine planets. That when one is counting in terms of natural reference, there are seven planes, and when one is counting in terms of language reference, there are nine planes. In Greek mythology, it's very, very simple. Orpheus has a lyre of seven strings, and Apollo has a lyre of nine strings. Orpheus refers back to the underground, the underworld, the netherworld. What is the netherworld? What is under existence? Nature. The seamless primordiality of nature. Whereas Apollo, the sun god, refers to the, the sky, the upper atmospheres, the atmosphere of language, key experience. Because as soon as you have language, experience is there. Experience registers because language happens. The interface of existence is therefore important and it is what ritual is about. Because that interface of ritual doing, what we actually do, is the very seam bridge between nature and experience. Our experience is able to be woven into nature by virtue of what we do. And so all true ethics are based upon your actions, what you do. We'll see later in the year when thought comes in, when symbols come in, when experience is distilled into essences, a lot of other changes happen. More changes than when we rose up from all fours to just two legs. Because when you walk with interior legs, everything changes. But we don't need to get to those complications yet. We don't have to consider that yet. We're just considering the ABCs of what happens when we do something and why it is that we prefer as a species and not just a species of Homo sapiens but the forerunner species of us Homo neanderthals, Homo erectus, Homo habilis back millions of years also prefer just like us to do the same actions in similar situations. 
when the weather changes and the west wind blows, we know that the berries are going to be ripe on certain plants that grow in a certain area, and we're going to go there and feed. So that we can say this, ritual has nothing to do with superstition. That's a stupid kind of slovenly slur that blurs any chance of understanding what is going on or what is real. Ritual has nothing to do with superstition. It has everything to do with what we would call practical, everyday sense of survival. And the encoding of ritual actions so that those sequences are repeatable, not only for generations, but forever. As long as these traditions are passed on, they will be kept. For instance, when one picks up a copy of the Masoretic text of the Bible, if you went down to Fairfax Avenue in Los Angeles and went into a Jewish store and you bought a Masoretic Bible, it would be exactly the same text as was codified in 90 AD, 90 CE, at the Council of Gemini. It is exactly the same text. It is ritual that is encoded in such a way that it is unchanged for 1900 years. Not a single uh, punctuation mark is different. I use this as an example of the way in which ritual needs to keep something registered and yet at the same time runs the peril of fossilizing and preventing something new. And so there is an archetypal question that comes up. How does creativity come into a ritual tradition once it has settled all of the important actions of life? Once the interrelationships of human beings with each other with the search for food, with the development of shelter, with the relationship of the atmosphere, with the relationship of the animal and plant kingdoms, the mineral kingdom. Once all of that is settled, it tends to ossify, it tends to fossilize, it tends to freeze itself, it tends to become petrified, not because of superstition, not because of ignorance, but because it does work. And if the world did not change, it would be very difficult to argue against this. But man has lived long enough that he has come to see that many things change, and in fact, all things finally are seen to change. If you go back far enough in geological time, what is today Antarctica was a tropical forest. so that all things change. And one of the first human beings to ever realize this on a scientific, practical level was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin records in one of his letters to one of his scientific confreres in London, writing from Philadelphia in the 1740s. He said, I have on my desk before me pieces of coal that have been dredged from underneath the shelf coast near Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, and that this coal level goes under the ocean sediments, and that this coal has within it impresses of fossilized plants, so that there were plants that were living on this earth that were impressed who knows how many millions of years ago, long before ocean sediments were even laid down. 
So that the whole quality that Franklin shows in that correspondence is the first realization that no matter how perfected a cultural tradition is, in face of the inevitable changes in nature, in order for man to survive, he needs creativity to change. And so a paradox comes in. We have to have ritual that is repeatable and transmissible that will not change so we can survive. And we also have to have creativity which will change everything or change some things so that we can survive. And so we are caught with two different kinds of qualities. In India, they call the qualities fire and iron. We have to have the iron of something that doesn't change, and we have to have the fire of something that does change and we have to find a way to put them together. Somebody once called the Bhagavad Gita the blending of fire and iron. And we call that wisdom. Not just instruction, not just knowing, but wisdom, because to take what seems to be polarities, what seems to be incommensurates, and put them together requires a higher order. And there's no way to have a higher order until one has the capacity to have numerical jumps of order. And for that, you have to bring in a zero quality to your ability to compute. One says, well, the idea of zero in mathematics was a, a tremendous achievement, first achieved in India first achieved by a man named Nargajuna, who lived to be a hundred years old. About 200 AD. Naga means uh, snakes, big snakes. Juna like Arjuna. So he was like the, the hero of the underworld realization quality, Nargajuna. How do we get zero? How do we get powers? How do we get geometricity out of existence if thought is not there? It comes because the very quality of existence can be quieted down. So instead of our actions being this, that, and the other, they can be quieted down until they occur in what we call a present moment the now. And the now is the zero point in existence. You don't have to have an idea of zero. You don't have to have thought at all. The whole horizon of thought doesn't even have to come into play. There are many animals who are very good at zero point existence nowness like cats when they're hunting. You watch a cat hunting, stalking a bird. You watch a lioness on film, most likely unless you're in the Serengeti, stalking uh, a wounded uh, zebra. Each step of the paw is now. There's no thought of the strategy of how many steps one is going to have to take. The cat does not think. The cat does. It's like Yoda, right? Yoda says, uh, don't say, do. I'm reminded of a pun I heard yesterday about uh, Japanese uh, figure of Yoda, and it was uh, just a toy. The toy Yoda. <coughs> we can back away from language in a nice way. <laughs> Notice here that the zero point of existence not only doesn't require thought, it doesn't require language. Cats usually don't speak. Although I had a daughter that was absolutely able to converse with cats. Maybe because she saw the cat from outer space when she was a little girl. 
Cats do not speak, but in their stalking they are now. The same thing happens, for instance, in China when the large stork herons are stalking fish, their movement is a now. And so a lot of the early Taoist Tai Chi movements to get present were based upon the movement of a stork. Or the way in which pairs of birds somehow, when they're hunting together, hawks always haunt hunt in pairs, there's a certain kind of emotion where they come back to the paredness. And they are for a moment completely balanced in the sky. And the kinesthetic equanimity of hunting hawks is what gives their sharp vision the ability to see an object. The eye of the hawk is 50 times as sharp as a human eye. You can see a mouse in a field from a mile high. But I can only see a mouse in the field from a mile, a mile high at a certain moment in the motion when there is a dead still zero one line base. Because any kind of motion would blur the focal line of vision. There has to be a moment for the hunting hawk when it sees only and exactly what is there. There's either a mouse there or not. And this is not just a Chinese quality. In ancient Egypt, the eye of Horus the hawk was the very symbol of insight, zero-based enlightenment, before thought, before language, on the existence level. The mystic eye of Horus sees and sees in such a way that there are wings, hawk wings, that are associated with the eye. But very often, the eye is written as a sun with wings. Because the ultimate seer is the sun in the sky. And when the sun is at its zenith, in its motion in the sky, it is the all-time universal symbol of correct seeing in existence. This is why Apollo whose chariot carries the sun on its wings, has a nine-string wire, because he sees exactly. Far-seer is the Homeric epithet for Apollo. Far-seer. He not only sees a mouse in the field from a mile high, he sees the accuracy of existence on any zenith, on any day. He sees what is real. Our whole concern with ritual at this particular point is to try to find some way to let it occur to us, to have it register in us that what we're looking at with Basho in Zen haiku poetry and what we're looking at with Ziami, with Japanese Zen no drama, that these two specifically chosen individuals, two of their creations, Izutsu by Ziami as a play about a haunted woman ghost seen through the meditative eye of an old priest in a haunted monastery yard. And Basho's Zen journey towards the end of his life, trying to find some way to blink out of the plane of existence to a higher level by using the correct language as threshold frames of reference, training himself like calisthenics to have that final moment that when he dies, he will use the right poem to transcend. And he will leave the plane of existence and be able to continue on higher orders of reality. We're trying to use Basho and Ziami to cinch for ourselves what we've been looking at for a couple of months. We're trying to see why it is that reality is real 
when we do something and if we do nothing, we by default fall into illusion. And that the whole mystery is bound up, as the Chinese would say, with Wu Wei, with not doing. Meaning not, not doing, but doing in such a way that not doing is a part of what is done, integrated together. Which takes us back to the very beginnings of the Course. If you remember, we began, like always, with using pairs of books just to give us a methodology which we could carry all the way through on all the levels. The pairs of books are like the calipers. There are ways in which we can carry that methodology of making shapes all the way through all the levels, all the processes. And the first pair of books were Thoreau, his little essay on walking, and the Chinese I Ching, the Book of Changes. Because we were concerned. We were concerned with the most basic thing that we could do on the natural level was to take a walk. And, but that walk takes place in a universe, in a nature, which is constantly changing. And in the I Ching, we saw that if we focus upon the idea of yin and yang, on the idea of polarities, we miss the I Ching. That's like being Descartes, thinking that ex you exist because you think that the synthesizing core of the I Ching on the foundation level is not yin-yang, but the five-phase energy cycle that begins with Tao, with zero-based nature. And how out of zero-based nature comes the unity of Te. So that when Lao Tzu writes his classic on Taoism, the classic insight vector to the very nature of the reality of the I Ching, he doesn't call his book Yin Yang, he calls his book Tao Te. And you have to be a very stupid, naive Westerner not to know that. And all the gym teachers parading as Taoist masters talking about Yin Yang, need to go back into meditation, need to go back into walking, and try it all over again. Because Tao Te is the binary, zero and one. Numeracy, which precedes literacy, which gives us the basis of how the resolving third, gen, human-heartedness, us, comes into play. Not because, not because, we're a linear third, but because we're the resolving ratio between zero and one. When you put tau te into a ratio, then you have what we are. Then you have a spiritual existence which is present in a now <coughs> that creatively knows from that all the resonant truths that there are. And one doesn't have to think at all. The Zen master doesn't look at dictionaries of ideas in order to be in his reality. In fact, when any thought comes into play, it will ruin, it will ruin the present moment. And the Japanese, as usual, refining everything, refined an art technique which allowed one to see if you could maintain a zero point. It's called sumi-e, painting. And with sumi-e painting, you have a stretched sheet of rice paper behind you, and on the table in front of you, you have all these jars of ink and various washes, and a huge crock of brushes, and you set yourself 
to take a brush and dip into a jar and turn and make a circle that doesn't quite close and return the brush. And that has to be a seamless movement because if there's any hitch, you will tear the paper. And a sumi demonstration will show anybody if you get an A in meditation or an F. Because if you tear the paper, you didn't do it, did you? You know you did. And if you don't tear the paper, then they say to you, now, can you do this in your mind so that you don't tear the natural fabric of your mind with any idea? And if you can do that, if you can draw a circle of existence without using any idea whatsoever and don't tear the mind at all, you wake up. It's called Satori Man. Let's take a break. This is the box that contained the first collection of haiku in English. And you can see it was huge. It, it, uh, by A. Miyamori, an anthology of haiku, ancient and modern. It has a nice, dusty, embossed top to the carton. And the volume itself was huge. And it was the first time that any collection of uh, haiku were, was put into English. Um, this is uh, Tokyo 1932, and it has, as the frontispiece, a portrait of Basho. Basho is like Shakespeare in Japan. He's the national poet and one of the world's great poets. Or like Homer in Greece, Arcarta in Germany, Dante in Italy, Cervantes in Spain. It seems that every nationality, every language group seems to have a major figure that the people themselves consider the, the great writer of their nation. And Basho is that for Japan. What we're looking at by Basho is the narrow road to the deep north. Oko no Hosumichi, the narrow road to the deep north. And the sense here is that there is a road plunging into the northern forested wildernesses, the mountains, out of town, out of the city of Edo, out of the life that had become so artificial that the mature Basho, near the end of his life, he took the name Basho, which means banana plant, because growing outside of the window of his little cottage was a banana plant. And he noticed how in the wind and the rain and the weather and the birds effect on it that banana plants fray, but they do not break and die. And he thought of himself as like a banana leaf, very frayed, but not broken. His narrow road to the deep north is the line of penetration that runs off the plane of existence that was the Edo of his day, the capital city, runs back into nature back into wilderness. Very often this trail in Navajo weaving techniques, it was called the spirit trail, it was one thread, one thread only, that was not a part of the composition, that ran out of the composition off the frame of reference. A spirit trail in the sense that it was the way to leave the composition. Just as in the Sumiye test for ability to meditate, 
if you closed the circle, that was also a sign of ignorance. And so a very good semi-circle has tremendous force. Its circularity shows a very strong, steady hand, the ink flowing very perfectly smooth, the circle exactly not closed. In high energy physics, in order to have a magnetic bottle to hold radiation, the only kind of bottle, the only kind of container that will hold radiation is a magnetic bottle. And you have to make sure that you can seal it, but you have to make sure that you have a way to let the radiation comes in before you seal it. You have to put the genie in the bottle, you have to have an opening away. And if you really wish to release the genie from the bottle, you have to have a way to unstopper it, to open it back up. So if there's this universal process that a form is like a beautiful bathtub which can be plugged so it will hold and it can be unplugged so that it can drain. So really good rituals understand that they have to hold existence together, and yet they have to have places where you can leave that bottle, leave that pattern. Like the Spirit Trail thread, or like Basho's Road to the Deep North. It's a way of leaving existence Not to destroy existence, but for you to be able to leave by going to a higher power, a higher level, another life. The spirit trail that leads out of existence for us, in the most primordial way, is the road of language the thread of language. How is that? It's very simple. If you can follow a line of words so that the meaning occurs to you, you can leave the plane of existence and enter an inner plane of symbols. You cannot go to an inner world unless you go by the thread of language. So that language turns out to be very interesting. It is the sealer of the forms that hold existence. It is, at the same time, the thread that leads out of those forms to an inner level, a symbolic level. And we will see, towards the end of this year, the whole last quarter of this year is about how symbols in the mind are as real as actions by the body. but on a higher level, on higher order. So that a symbol, a single symbol, could index all of the actions of a single culture. How powerful is a symbol? A symbol as an index for an entire culture's activity allows for one to move to such a higher plane of power. The realized mind is capable of not only holding an entire culture in its entirety, all of its actions, all of its meanings, but any number of cultures, any number of traditions. The powers of mind are uh, astonishing. But what this education about is about is that the powers of person are equally objective to the body and the mind, and the powers of a person are much more than the powers of symbols. And while people are ooing and aahing over the powers of the mind, 
in culture-bound ritual levels, the realized person looks upon symbols as uh, toy blocks, children's blocks. Hardly worth comment. And we'll see that there's a fourth level beyond the person even. Because the person will be like one of those magnetic bottles able to take the radiation of conscious vision and either hold it or release it. Release it into something equally objective called the cosmos. And the body and the mind are real on an integral level and the person and the cosmos are objectively real on the differential level. And once we have that quaternary those four levels of objectivity and the four processes out of which they come, then we will have an education that is complete. An education that has looked at all of our capacities in the order in which they occur, and we will have what microbiology had with the discovery of the sequencing of DNA. We will be able to look at any place, person, situation, and understand what is going on to any degree of specificity and what to do next or what to redo in order to have a fuller presence of whatever stage we're at or to use them all at once. This is the kind of education that is needed for a planetary culture, for a population of people who are going to be able to have descendants who will be able to choose whatever planet they want to live on in whatever star system they choose. And there's no sense in getting huffy about losing a particular culture because no cultures have to be lost at all. They're all essential. They're all necessary to remember by actual observance. But there should not be that exclusivity where the preservation of cultures forbid us to go into the further realms of our capacity. Those must also be admitted. And so it's an inclusive realm that this education speaks to. Let's take a look at Basha. Two qualities here, a pair of qualities. He actually went on a journey, and we could call that a Zen journey. And he kept a journal of the journey, and we could call that a haiku journal. So there's the journey and the journal. And they have the same relationship that haiku and Zen have. The journal indexes the journey, the haiku indexes the Zen. How so? When we are moving in our walking, in our motion, immersing ourselves in nature, the zero point of existence that occurs is the now, the present moment. The haiku is the language of that present moment. The haiku in the journal makes the now of the journey manifest. So Basho will write his journal, and when he comes to a present moment, instead of writing about that present moment, he delivers the present moment in a haiku. So the haiku is a frame of reference that has only oneness within it. He notes the multi-layered, many ambivalent qualities of nature. It's the ocean of change of nature. But when he comes to a special, specific juncture, he pauses, and instead of writing prose, he writes a haiku. Now, as we've seen in our education, we have to put ourselves we have to try out ourselves, our own practicality, because that's the only way we really learn. 
We have to put this body in that activity. We have to put this mind in that experience in order to learn. And later on next year we'll see we have to put our person in that vision. Because only then do we learn. Just like we will see that finally we have to put this cosmos in our history. <laughs> then we have it. Then we have not just the ikebana of some aesthetic, but we have the fields of flowers that allow for indefinite ikebanas. So we need to also have the experience of writing a haiku, but not just a haiku, but a haiku that comes out of a prose writing where we have the actual experience of coming to a present now, a moment. And by presenting that moment in a haiku, our haiku needs to be embedded in a little journal of some kind of a movement. And so we're going to go back to our walks. We're going to take a fourth walk. But this time, in your walk, whenever you come to some moment, present that moment. Don't describe it, but present that moment in a haiku. So you might write a page or two of a walk and have one, two, three, four haiku in it. Hopefully more than one. Sometimes all, one is all that you can manage. One is all you need. In other words, you're going to do a miniature basha for yourself, a miniature Zen journal for yourself. So now you go back to the way in which we began this course. You took three walks, and you described those walks. You wrote them up, and you read them to each other. The first walk was just simply taking a walk from where you live around your neighborhood and back to your house and simply recording that. And the second walk you took, you did the same thing, but you took a single natural image, a single element like water or fire or air. And you tried to note as many times as you could that element in that walk. And then you took a second walk, a different element, and did the same thing. Now, instead of taking an element to highlight your walk, now take your quality of being able to experience a present moment, a nowness. And wherever on your walk there's a nowness, mark that as a place to make a haiku. And try your best to make the haiku then and there. And if you can't, later on, try to recreate that for yourself and then make the haiku. So you're going to take a fourth walk. Now notice that at the end of ritual, we're putting a fourth element into three elements that were there at the beginning of nature. So if our education is a two-year program, we're six months into it, we're one-fourth into it, we're knitting the two, nature and ritual. We're knitting the whole first quarter of our education together by the simple activity of taking a fourth walk and adding haiku as the highlighting quality instead of a natural image, a natural element. It's very simple, believe me, it's very effective. And notice here that in terms of nature and ritual, there's no mention whatsoever of ideas, there's no mention of thought, there's not even any critical mention of language. <coughs> We're not interested in those things yet. We're not interested in all of the grand higher capacities that we will explore later on. We just want to take a walk and write a haiku when something occurs to us as being right there. I look up and I see the branches of the pine growing here, that Italian rock pine and the way in which the branches catch the sunlight, and the way in which sunlight, which is whole, seems to be frayed if I just look at the branches and the pine nodes. And I'm immediately struck 
that here on a hot day of June, frayed sunlight from the garden calls to me. It's just simply a spontaneous haiku. Now, there is a tradition in Japan for almost a thousand years before Basho about using poetry to express a present moment. But the peculiar quality of the Japanese people, the peculiar quality of Japanese culture, is that that language was always highly stylized to work only in the noble court life. The Japanese poetry never came out of the nature in the wilderness, in the boondocks. It always came out of the court etiquette. Japanese poetry was from the get-go always a court phenomenon. Then when you're at court, there's only one person that's real, and that's the emperor. That's the whole nature of a court, of a kingdom, that the king is the most real person, and everyone else is on pecking orders, depending how close they are to the king. And that the Japanese kingship was patterned, was modeled, was imitated from the Chinese pattern. And so one needs to know about the Chinese pattern of court kingship in order to understand that for a thousand years Japanese language was an in-town phenomenon and when Basho uses his language specifically to walk out of town, he's making a radical revolution in Japan that no one had seen before. He's using the very glue that kept the court ethic together to unglue the entire pattern and to show that it has a release into something so incomprehensible that almost no one had even guessed that there was that possibility. So that Basho is indeed very, very great poet, colossally great. Because he's the first time in Japanese history that somebody was able to snap their fingers and wake up out of the pattern of life that they thought was absolutely essential to existence and realize there is an indefinite freedom and variety outside of this. Basho is the first person to go outdoors in Japanese history and to say so. And that symbolically, haiku becomes ever after Basho the symbol of freedom in the present for the Japanese psyche. So that when a Japanese psyche is able to write a haiku, it's like a triumph that one has joined Basho on the road to the real. And yes, you may have to work in the corporate courts of 20th century Tokyo, but it's damn nice to know that if you have to, you can get out and get free. And writing a haiku is that quality for the Japanese soul that you can still breathe fresh air. So we're dealing with very important things. As the world becomes more and more modeled on Japanese corporate business, it's interesting to know how they get free while sitting in their chair in the executive office suites 500 feet above the Ginza, not even moving from the telephone, but maybe writing a haiku right then and there, and getting that freedom and variety that Walt Whitman said was characteristic of Mother Nature. When we ask her what she likes, she says, I like freedom and I like variety. That's what she says. And when she sees us she, doing that, she says, these are my children. The world is yours. Explore it. She doesn't like stuffy people who do not respect freedom and variety, who get trapped into the frozen, petrified fields of existence. They end up like those ants in amber, 
50 million years later, still just an ant in amber. Better to be free and be at home in a cosmos. There are all kinds of worlds to have. So the Zen journey has a haiku journal. The haiku journal is the language level and the Zen journey is the natural level. And where they interface, that's the plane of existence. The world of the Zen journey is the world of nature. The world of the haiku journal is the beginnings of language and the mythic atmosphere. Now we can back away from the metaphor of ocean and air, and we can talk about now how the horizon of existence, the plane of existence like a horizon, is very curious. It is not anything in and of itself which should not be surprising because it's the viscous surface of nature. And nature is not anything in and of itself. It is a mystery. Nature is not a there that's there. It's not a there that's here. It's not a here that's there. It's not a here that's here. It's mysterious. And the surface of the mystery, like the bubble surrounding the mystery, is that sphere of existence. And it's just like in the Tao Te. The Te is mysteriously one, just like the Tao is mysteriously zero. That's why they go together. That's why they're a binary. That's why they make a language that is numerically logic to any degree of specificity. All of the computers of the world operate on the binary 0 and 1. There are some new variations coming up that would be quite interesting. But all the ones in the world at this time all work because a binary of 0 and 1 is able to be specific to an nth degree and therefore you can create virtual reality by that basis. Now notice here that if 0 and 1 were seen to be yin and yang, you would miss the point entirely of what is rational about them. Because yin and yang, when they come together, they come together like a transformed polarity. And a polarity which is transformed makes a complementarity. But tau and te are not a complementarity. They're a ratio. Therefore, the correct language is to talk about the ratio of the real and not the transformation of polarities. The transformation of polarities is a psychological jargon that's datable to 19th century Europe and has nothing to do whatsoever with universal wisdom. It has everything to do with a certain cultural ethos of 19th century Europe. And to be talking that kind of jargon in the late 20th century and to think that you're hip is embarrassing. And it's simply the inability for the so-called teachers to think clearly enough to turn off the radio in their minds and to experience existence it has to be rather pristinely experienced, but nevertheless, if cats can do it, why can't you? And stalk the wild origins of language. And when you do that, you learn that just before that paw print, there is a silence which reverberates, where the zero carries an oomph that becomes one. The one is the oomph of the zero. The one is like the exclamation mark. And so one poetically 
and a Hollywood aesthetic could write one as an exclamation mark. That is exclamation mark and zero that are the binary of the way in which things happen and are real. And we'll see later on that it's this kind of numerical codification that makes fairy tales charming. And have a completely different flavor from myths. Because a fairy tale is a differential language that presents conscious nouns, whereas a mythology is an integral language that presents the continuities out of which a noun could occur. A good myth moves on and has its swirls almost like a Mandelbrot fractal. It, a good myth will always have more and more variations indefinitely using the same themes over and over again. And we'll see that mythologies always have as a structure, they have a family relationality. Mother, father, child, mother, father, daughter, son, brother, there are always family structures to mythology, families of the gods. Whereas fairy tales always have loner creatures that come in from the outside and can go back out to the outside. All of a sudden, in the nice palace family is a little frog that has to be taken to the dinner table because it got the golden ball for the little princess. And has to be not only fed at the dinner table out of her plate, has to be carried to her bed. She has to even kiss that frog, becomes a prince. A fairy tale, we will see, is a completely different structure from a myth. A myth is meant to glue a culture together. A fairy tale is meant to liberate a consciousness to personhood. And fairy tales are all about person making, whereas myths are all about keeping the culture together. And they do work together, but they also very often are dissonance. And a lot of times cultures are at war with individuals. They consider them outlaws to be cast out because they are different from everybody else. The loner in a culture very often is orphaned, thrown out. So that the men and women who learned about differential prayer in late antiquity were told, you can't stay in the culture. You have to go to a monastery. You can do that outside. Get out in the desert. Get out in the caves. Get out in the mountains. But don't participate in town. And so around the 370s AD in Western civilization, all of the fairy tale people were outlawed to be celibate in monasteries. And within about two generations, the life juice went out of the civilization and it became ossified. With mythologies that didn't change, became doctrines that were argued about indefinitely of little picky points and there was no life in it at all. And the whole civilization fell apart. Because when you squeeze the juice out and put it someplace where it sours, you lose the juice as well as the fruit. Now the same conditions are going to come up in the 23rd century. And if we don't do something intelligent now, the same damn thing will happen then. They're not going to be able to make any decision about it at all because the decision is made in this generation. This is where it's made. And the decision has to be, we don't have to go through whole cycles of dark ages. We've already done that. They don't go anywhere. They don't do anything. They're boring. Why do we have to set up Inevitable triggers to bore whole generations of our descendants 
because we're sitting on our hands. That's just stupid. How do you change it? You have to get a matrix of transformation operating. Otherwise, nothing will change. That's what this education is. And it can be used on any level for individuals, for whole societies. If we look at Basho, if we look at the narrow road to the deep north, one of the qualities that comes out of it is a quality which the Japanese call sabi, sabi. The immediate translation of sabi is lonely or loneliness. Lonely, not in the sense of sophomoric, sentimental loneliness, but lonely in the sense of someone who is beginning to poke out of the pattern and beginning to look out and realize that there's such a scope of freedom and variation that they become almost giddy, almost like with vertigo. There's a famous Renaissance portrait of the world of gears where everything was all nicely formed and somebody's on the top gear looking out and there's this whole realm of stars and spirals and, and, and worlds beyond worlds. Sabi is the feeling tone that comes the very moment that one begins to sense that there's a lot more to what is real than you thought. And you're lonely because everything that you identify as secure all of a sudden is brought into question. The polite way to say it is like the old song, maybe it isn't so. Say it isn't so, but you know that it is. Sabi is that feeling tone, the seed of that feeling tone, that there's a disjointedness that is beautiful that comes through as loneliness, and yet one, fearful as you are, you have to pursue it. Basho's haiku has distinctively sabi. One can read any number of haiku, and when you come across a haiku that has this tone of sabi in it, you can almost bet that it's basho or basho derivative. It's a characteristic of Basho, just like a characteristic of Shakespeare is the flamboyant way in which he bends words to fit into different categories. He'll use a verb as a noun, and it'll come through in scintillation. He'll use a string of nouns as a whole raft of verbal or adverbial usages. Shakespeare takes words out of the grammatical text and puts them into a dramatic free-for-all because that's the kind of a person he was. Basho takes words out of the court ethic that for a thousand years Japanese poetry was based on and turns them inside out so the quality of sabi happens and a second quality called hosumi, which means slenderness, which means that he says it with as little language as possible. So that frequently only one or two words. So that one has to narrow one sense of what is being talked about so that increasingly you are just sharing the present moment because the words are only what they are. So that a haiku by Basho that happens very early and he has travel on. Here's the prose leading up to the haiku, and then I'll give you the haiku. He writes, on the first day of April, I climbed Mount Nico to do homage to the holiest of shrines upon it. This mountain used to be called Nico with just one K, and now it's called Nico with two Ks. When the high priest Kukai built a temple upon it, however, he changed the name to Nico, two caves, which meant the bright beams of the sun. Pronounced Nico, 
there was a place pronounced Nikko was the word for bright sun beams. Kukai must have had the power to see a thousand years into the future, for the mountain is now the seat of the most sacred of all shrines. And its benevolent power prevails throughout the land, embracing the entire people, like the bright beams of the sun. To say more about the shrine would be to violate its holiness. So he stops writing the prose and he gives this haiku. It was with awe that I beheld fresh leaves, green leaves, bright in the sun. Now we're not Japanese. We don't get it. Most of us have never been there. But the kind of shrine that Kukai set up was the kind of shrine that he learned about when he went to, uh, to China and brought back from China a very peculiar religious experience. Kukai lived in what in Chinese chronology was called the Tang Dynasty. He lived in the very early 700s, the late 600s, the early 700s. And when he went to China, the great emperor in China was Tang Taizong. And Taizong, in order to make the Tang Dynasty the great cultural prize of Chinese history, brought together the essential realized core of all the great religions and put them together in such a way that they're what we would call today parallel processing. They were not cross-fertilized so much, not blended together, not made synchronistically one big mash, but they were put in such parallels that anyone who understood deep, profound experience in any one of them would see that there were then parallels in all of them and so that there was an international toleration. In order to give a beginning which was equidistant from all the Chinese populations, Tai Tsung used a special religious experience which he had a huge stella, a carved stone pillar, about seven feet high, put in the middle of the Tang court. This stella described what we know from history as Nestorian Christianity. And Tai Tsung used, in the Tang Dynasty in China, esoteric Nestorian Christianity as the zero point, as the transition to the oneness of realization in all religions, Taoist, Buddhist, Confucius, Islam, Judaism, every. But he used esoteric Nestorian Christianity and so when Kukai went there to the town court, he brought a copy of the Stella back to Japan and erected a duplicate there. When Manley Hall went to visit in the early 1920s, he said you climbed step after step after step after step, and when you got up to the shrine, there was this enormous roof, like Le Cousier's Rangchamp, enormous roof over a very slender series of posts holding this enormous thatched roof up. And you, after having gone up all these steps, then went down under in the earth because the shrine was carved out of the earth of the mound and you went down into the pool darkness and there was specifically exactly nothing there. There was no Buddha there. There was no Shinto symbols there. No Islamic, nothing. Because Nestorian Christianity, its symbol was complete, utter, blank darkness. Because once you have been in perceptually complete, utter, blank darkness, the emergence from that, any image hits you with such impress 
that you realize what existence is. And Matley said the first thing when he stepped out of Kukai's blank darkness, empty shrine, he saw sunlight on vegetation and he remembered this poem of Basho because the first thing that touched Basho was that bright leaves and sunlight are extremely accurately real. They're really there. And that means that we're really here, and that's really good to know. We're not a fiction of anybody's imagination, especially our own. We really are here. And to know that is the beginning of wisdom. Because if you're really here, and they're really here, you take a lot of care about what you're doing, because it's going to stick. Whatever you do is going to really happen. Like my old... Jewish grandmother used to say, you better not frown too frequently because it might freeze on your face and you'd have that forever. Think about it. When we come back next week, try to bring some haiku that you've written. And also pay attention to the fact that within a month, the fourth week from today, we're going to do the ceremony with the masks. Now, the only requirement for the ceremony with the masks is that I don't participate in it. All of you have made two masks. One mask of something from your diet, one mask of a feeling. Something from outside that comes in, something from inside that comes out. And the only requirement is that you use all of the masks that are brought together. So everybody who's going to participate will bring two masks. And the only requirement is that you don't leave any mask out. All of them must be brought together. Why is that so? Because it's only the guarantee that all of the masks that are participating together will make a cultural form that we can count on later on. What are we going to count on? We're going to count on some kind of a form which is made here with this questing companionship of people. It will be the basis upon which the interiorization to the symbolic form will happen. Now remember what I said, that in Taoist cosmology, mythology, when all the stones of, all the black stones of reality were put together to make the vault of heaven, one stone was left over. Don't leave a stone left over. Include all the masks. It's important. Some of you have been here before have seen this process. Help those that haven't. If you haven't made your masks, now's the time to get busy and make your masks. Notice that the mask making assignment coincides with the use of haiku in the journeys, the journeys which are just the walks. So we're knitting together now, we're integrating. We're knitting together the walks in nature, the masks in ritual, with the haiku, which are the beginnings of language, the beginnings of myth. So that this next month is the way in which nature, ritual, and myth are put together in such a woven, fabric, that that fabric can be interiorized to the point that an inner world begins to occur. One of the very great things in education is to be able to witness exactly how your inner world takes a place in reality. Once you understand that, you don't have to study philosophy, complex philosophies of symbols, wondering what they're talking about. You can look at anybody's philosophy of symbols and understand from your own experience what it is that they're unable to say. That's what a good education is, to be able to read in between the lines. If you're having to read other people's lines all the time, you're always going to be queuing up behind them for your sense of reality. But when you learn to see between everybody else's lines in your own way, that's the beginning 
wisdom. That's really getting an education. It happens to be worth 25 bucks a week. I think so. More next week. Thank you.